Tyr presides over the triad as a paternal figure, in bastion of justice for his followers to emulate. His faith is one of staunch loyalty and unwavering capitulation. I'm Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. With Tyr, we get to tackle how a deity from two or more separate pantheons operate functionally in Dungeons & Dragons canon. For those of you who listened to the Ogma episode in the past, I'm going to be giving the same overview I did at the start of that episode, so feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes. A few deities from the Faeronian pantheon come from other pantheons. Each one of these deities exists in the pantheon from our real-world religions that have polytheistic beliefs. Ogma and Sylvanus are Celtic deities. Loviatar and Mailiki are Finnish deities. And Tyr is a Norse deity. Each of these deities is classified as an interloper deity, compared to that of native deities. Native deities of the Forgotten Realms are those that were around during the creation Toral, like Shantia or Shar, or arose sometime after during the timeline of Toril, like Torm or Siric. An interloper deity is a deity who was worshipped on another plane or material world until their presence and influence was brought through to Toril via their worshippers or other means. To the vast majority of people on Toril, they aren't aware of such things or would even concern themselves with such a categorization. Though theological scholars are interested in such a delineation. The five deities I listed earlier are included in this category alongside the racial pantheons, like the Drow Pantheon, as I have covered in the past, or the Orcish Pantheon, just as some examples. Interloper deities were allowed into the crystal sphere of realm space presided over by Eo for a long time. That was until Eo began putting up formal boundaries around what entity could exist as a deity in realm space. Now here's where the canon conflicts a bit. In the third edition supplement, Faiths and Pantheons, it says that the aspect of a deity in Toril is independent to that of the aspect of a deity on another plane or world. Which I can agree with somewhat. As I will talk about further into the podcast, Tyr as he exists in the North's Pantheon has some differences that to what is known of Tyr in the Faerunian Pantheon. The issue is that the supplement says that if a team of adventurers native to Toril were capable of reaching Tyr's planar home on Mount Celestia and slaying him, only the Toril aspect of Tyr would die. That means in some mystical way, which I will admit, definitely fits the power of a deity, Tyr in the Norse pantheon would still exist. The perspective I agree with most is that taken by the second edition supplement Face and Avatars. In this supplement, it is stated that deities who exist in pantheons outside of Toril are the same as deities they are in the pantheons of Toril. In that, if the same adventuring party from Toril kills Tyr under this perspective, they kill Tyr both in the Faerunian pantheon and in the Norse pantheon across any prime material worlds or planes where he is venerated, despite the differences Tyr represents in these two pantheons. Though the supplement does stipulate, quote, even then one has to be careful not to assume too much, end quote. Either way, I think a DM trying to adhere to canon is free to use either perspective or an amalgam of both. Throughout the episode, I will allude to where differences exist between the understanding of Tyr in the Forgotten Realms and that of Tyr elsewhere in the D&D universe as a deity in the Norse pantheon. It is important to note that when describing deities taken from our own world religions, the authors do point out that they did take some liberties and creative freedoms with their descriptions. As it is, I only have a passing familiarity with the pagan Norse religion. Without doing a large amount of research to ensure I'm speaking with confidence on the topic, I will only explain what it is the source books from D&D describe about their version of Tyr. Titles Some of the titles Tyr goes by in the Faerunian pantheon are Grimjaws, The Even-Handed, The Maimed God, Wounded Tyr, Blind Tyr, The Just God, 
the blind overlord, the wounded one, and the lord of justice. Tyr has one alias in the Forgotten Realms. In Kalimshan, Tyr is known as a Noctir. In the Norse pantheon, Tyr is also known as the One-Handed. Portfolio and Domains Tyr's singular portfolio in the Forgotten Realms is Justice. In the Norse pantheon, Tyr's portfolio is a bit different depending on what source book you go by. In 1st edition, his portfolio was simply just swordsmanship. Come 2nd edition, his portfolio is expanded to include courage, law, and swordsmanship. Finally, in 3rd edition, his portfolios are listed as courage, trust, strategy, tactics, and writing. Norse Tyr's suggested domains for 5th edition are knowledge and war. The Faerunian Tyr's suggested domain is war. Though later published in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, it is called out that the Order Domain is another fitting domain for Tyr. Appearance and Manifestations The Norse version of Tyr looks like a muscular and bearded human male who is missing his right hand. He wields a plus three longsword in his left hand. The Freyrudian version of Tyr shares similar physical characteristics to that of his Norse aspect, though he's described to be more aged and wizened. Sometimes he does wield a warhammer. Much like his Norse persona, Tyr in the Forgotten Realms is missing his right hand. It's not gone without notice that it may be a bit of a cruel joke to have the title of the even-handed attributed to him for this very reason. What's more is that Tyr was blinded given Eo's punishment described later at the onset of the Time of Troubles. Some religious depictions show a bloody bandage covering Tyr's eyes as a result. Ilmater helps to guide Tyr should the need to travel arise. The wounds Tyr has suffered are held up to be emblematic of the sacrifices and costs associated with ensuring proper justice and righteousness are carried out. Tyr has named his longsword Justicier. In 3rd edition terms, Justicier is a plus 5 Vorpal longsword. Tyr's avatar looks much like his true form. He either wields a longsword or a warhammer in battle and wears chainmail for armor. The longsword this avatar wields is effectively a plus three longsword of sharpness in second edition terms. This longsword was either granted to the avatar either by Tyr or whichever deity held the portfolio of justice before Tyr's arrival. Mistras worked on the sword in some capacity. The Warhammer functions as a plus three Warhammer with the same capabilities as a maze of disruption against the undead. His avatar wears a clean white gauze covering their eyes. Despite the gauze that surrounds their eyes, the avatar's eyes are visible to all who see them. When the avatar first arrives, their eyes are bright lights. Slowly this light fades to black voids until the avatar finally departs. A halo of light surrounds the top of the avatar's head. Tyr's avatar chooses to appear often to preside over cases that may seem insignificant, but Tears knows that such cases themselves can have far-reaching consequences, if not properly adjudicated. The avatar is immune to all illusions, phantasms, and emotion manipulation spells. Tyr has three known manifestations to show his favor or disfavor on the prime material. The first is the sound of a gong being struck, followed by a choir of unseen male voices. The second is the appearance of a glowing warhammer that seems to be manipulated by unseen hands. It will point, strike, or even cast spells out of it, demonstrating Tyr's intent. The third is through the summoning of large and obedient war dogs that act out Tyr's intentions. Abilities as a Norse deity, Tyr can sense any thief within a hundred feet of him. He also has true sight. As a greater Faerunian deity, Tyr is granted the best possible die roll, and on any die roll that he rolls, his divine senses stretch out to a distance of 18 miles, which is approximately 29 kilometers. This allows him to see, hear, touch, and smell things within that range. These divine senses also extend out to within 18 miles of any of his worshippers, holy sites, objects, or any location where someone last spoke his name within the last hour. What's more is that his divine senses can reach out to 20 different places at once. 
The divine senses of other deities equal to or beneath his divine rank can be blocked out by Tyr. In particular, he is tied with his portfolio of justice so strongly that he knows about any injustice 1810 days, which is 180 days, before it happens, while it is happening, or 1810 days after it has occurred. Tyr can create any magical item, armor, or weapon that confers to the wielder the ability to see through someone's lies or illusions. Tyr's avatar can pick out any rogue and see them for what they are. The avatar also boasts other strong senses, true sight, alignment sense, and detect lies. Any spells cast by the avatar that are related to law are three times as powerful compared to their normal effects. Those who are the targets of such spells are affected by a negative three penalty against their saves. Personal History In a tale some likely have heard from Norse myth, the Norse god Tyr lost his hand to Fenrir, aka Fenris Wolf. d d sources touch on the basics of the story, with the tale differing slightly from book to book. In general, the tale includes the following elements. A strong enough binding was made by the dwarves to bind Fenrir. This was done after two previous bindings made by the Aesir had failed to trap Fenrir. Fenrir, however, would not allow this binding to be placed upon him without one of the gathered Aesir putting their hands in his mouth. Fenrir sensed that the Aesir were up to some sort of trick. The only one willing to volunteer was Tyr. When Fenrir could not break out from this binding, Fenrir bit down, biting off Tyr's right hand. At least in the Dungeons and Dragons version of the tale, by subjugating himself and honoring his word, Tyr was rewarded with the portfolio of law. In the Norse pantheon, Tyr presides over the Valkyries, ensuring only the courageous warriors find their way to Valhalla. Tyr sought influence in the Forgotten Realms because Thor had slowly taken over his influence over the warriors who favored the Norse pantheon. As a result, his power had wavered. Tyr came to Toril having to submit himself before the rule of the overgod Eo, however. It is said that Tyr arrived in Faerun in negative 247 Dale Reckoning. In the faith, this event has been called the Procession of Justice. Tyr specifically arrived through a portal near modern-day Alaghan, leading 200 Archons. This force made their way across the Vilhan Reach, defeating the remainder of the Jamdoth Empire. This force slew Valgin Thirdborn, a lesser deity of anarchy who had arrived in negative 269 Dale Reckoning. This deity had influenced the remaining factions of Jean Doff to fight the very elves who had brought them down before. Ilmater and Torm would go on to ally themselves during or sometime after the Procession of Justice, forming the Triad. The procession lasted nine years until negative 238 Dale Reckoning. When Tyr first bore through into Faerun, it is not said explicitly whether or not he had both hands, but I th- believe he did. There are two competing stories to explain how Tyr lost his hand in the Faerunian pantheon. The first goes that at some time, Tyr engaged the evil entity known as Kezef the Chaos Hound in battle, and in that battle, Kezef bit down and tore off Tyr's right hand. The second story is akin to that of the story of Tyr and Fenrir. However, Kesef is put in the place of Fenrir, and the ice here have been replaced by what seems to be solely the good-aligned Faerudian deities like Gond and Mistra. It would seem that the greater universe has a sense of ensuring certain things transpire. Tyr's destiny and fate seems tied to immensely powerful canines. It did not take long for Tyr's faith to cement itself in Faerun. Now, many centuries later, Tyr's faith has a strong presence, and he's a very well-known deity with a vast amount of worshippers. However, I will now refer to a Candlekeep Forms post in which Ed Greenwood answers a question about whether Tyr was present in the Forgotten Realms before his arrival during the Procession of Justice. Ed Greenwood says yes. Tyr was a member of the Jamdathi pantheon as a Noctir, which would place Tyr in the realms for thousands of years. I've included a link to this post down below in the notes for the podcast. Mind you, this isn't given in any books, but I know some folks take what Ed says about the realms to be canon regardless if they are in recognized source books or not. 
In the description of the Balance of Belaros, which I will discuss later in the Magic Items section of the podcast, the dates given there also precede Tyr's supposed entrance into the Forgotten Realms. Tyr was blinded by the Overgod Ao at the outset of the Time of Troubles as a form of punishment. Ao blinded Tyr after Tyr questioned Ao's decision to punish all the deities in the face of the transgressions of Bane and Mercule, though they were unknown at the time. In 1384 Dale Reckoning, an argument arises between Siamorph and Tyr about an ongoing battle between Tathir and Kalimshan down in Faerun. Unable to rectify their disagreement, Siamorph moves her realms from the House of the Triad to Sunni's Lair of Brightwater. This was during the 3rd edition era, so the realms and planes of the World Tree model are used. In order to mend the rift that had suddenly been brought about, Suni recommends that Tyr marries Taimora in order to restore balance. In some form of misunderstanding, Helm becomes accused of trying to steal Taimora away from Tyr. Both of these lawful deities were bound to battle one another by their strict ideals. In the battle, Tyr kills Helm. At this point, everyone removes themselves solemnly as Timor returns with Tyr to the House of Triad. It is suspected that Sirik had something at work in this plot, though it cannot be proven. Unhappy with the actions of Tyr in these events, Ilmater breaks the Triad and moves his realm from the House of the Triad to Brightwater. The following year, Tyr would accompany Lathander and Suni in imprisoning Sirik in his realm of the Supreme Throne after Sirik killed Mistra and brought about the Spell Plague. Realizing the repercussions of Helm's death and feeling a great degree of shame, Tyr abdicated his position as a greater deity to Torm. Tyr later perished in self-sacrifice defending the Upper Plains from a demonic invasion. Torm would go on to preside in his absence, absorbing much of his responsibilities, station, and faithful worshippers and petitioners. Omader also returned to Torm on Mount Celestia, and with Bahamut formed the Triad once more. Clearly, after the second sundering, Tyr returned, and though it is not stated, Torm likely out of a sense of duty, returned all aspects of Tyr's faith that he had been temporarily presiding over. Personality Tyr is a lawful good deity. If I was to make an educated guess as to what power level Tyr currently exists at in the current day Faerun, Tyr would be a greater deity. At the very least, an intermediate deity. In the Norse pantheon, Tyr is an intermediate deity. His alignment in this pantheon had been listed as a lawful good deity up until the source book from 3rd edition, Deities and Demigods, which set his alignment at lawful neutral going forward. Tyr despises those who go through life not keeping to their oaths and words, and those who get by on deception. It has been put forward that the very concept of trial by duel was a creation of Tyr's. Tyr has adopted a paternal persona as he looks to build a society built around proper morals and laws for Faerudian mortals. Though this clashes with Tyr's knowledge that mortals are fallible and can never truly build the utopia he envisions for them. For this reason, Tyr exists in a perpetual state of stern sadness. Though it is not unheard of for his stern demeanor to crack as he is capable of affection and love. After all, he is very protective of his clergy, and compared to most other deities, his manifestations appear to aid them far more often. Personal Realms In the Great Wheel cosmology used for 1st, 2nd, and now currently 5th edition, Tyr resides on two outer planes. Mount Celestia, the lawful good outer plane, and Ysgard, the chaotic neutral and chaotic good plane between Arborea and Limbo in the Great Wheel. On Mount Celestia, Tyr's realm is known as the court it can be found on the first layer of Mount Celestia named Lunia. Sometimes Tyr refers to this realm as the Just House. On Ysgard, Tyr shares the realm of Asgard with other members of the Norse pantheon on the first layer that bears the same name as the plane itself. Mount Celestia is the upper plane of good and purity. The mountain is central to this plane and there are seven layers that ascend up to the summit. Each layer is separated by a level of fog that makes up the sky for that level. Across the mountain are several trails and paths that lead in various directions. 
In order to ascend up the mountain, travelers have to find the true path up to the next layer. Such journeys are considered trials to test worshippers. Those worshippers separate from the dwarven, halfling, and dragon deities who, re- who reside on Mount Celestia become archons. Much like devils, the archons move through a hierarchy of beings of greater power, though their motivations are more about holy service and good deeds. The first layer of Mount Celestia, Lunia, which is sometimes called the Silver Heaven, is surrounded by a silver-colored ocean made up entirely of holy water. The layer serves as the entry point for all visitors to the plain of Mount Celestia, and they all come in through the sea of holy water. The clear sky of Lunia is in perpetual nighttime. However, the layer is well illuminated by the bright full moon and stars. Ysgard is a sprawling plain made of sweeping, vastly unsettled landscapes for heroic adventure. The environments are at their extremes. The mountains are tall, the caverns deep, and the storms are strong. Ysgard is made up of floating, massive moats of earth that float slowly around one another in constant motion. These moats will occasionally collide, creating earthquakes. Some are smaller in size and are known as earthbergs, while the largest moats are as large as continents. Mortals and souls who reside on the layer of Ysgard can fight and adventure freely without much consideration for their well-being. For if they die, the next day they will rise alive and well to face another challenge. Ysgard is the primary home of the Norse gods, both the Aesir and Vanir. Here they often go about masquerading as mortals to be amongst their various partitioners. The realm of Asgard on this layer serves as a home for all the Aesir. Asgard is a cold realm and bordered by a stone wall 40 feet thick and 80 feet tall. Within the realm of Asgard, several of the chief locations in Norse myth can be found, including Valhalla, Lake Amsvatnir, and the Eyving River. Asgard does not have any settlements. Instead, large groups of petitioners and peoples live in the halls built on the large estates of the Aesir. Weather Tyr has his own hall in Asgard, Kozan said. Perhaps he does, though it is much smaller than those of the other Aesir. Perhaps he doesn't or once did, but now finds his home in the court on Mount Celestia, choosing to come to Odin's Hall known as Gladsheim from time to time. In the World Tree Cosmological model used for 3rd edition, Tyr resides on the plane of the House of the Triad. Here he resides with two other members of the Triad, Torm and Ilmater. This is a plain full of majestic halls and palaces, lit by an ever-present radiance. Law here is more the defining characteristic rather than good on this plane, given the presence of the other lawful neutral deities here with the lawful good deities. Confusingly, there is a mountain here called Celestia. Much like it does in the Great Wheel, the mountain is divided into its normal seven layers and presided over by the Paragon Archons. However, there are three mounds surrounding Mount Celestia where the realms of Ilmater, Tyr, and Torm lie upon each mountain's summit. Angels and Archons are found here in service to the Triad. Tyr's realm, the court, is a large hall made of marble resembling that of a court of law. A lie cannot be said in the court, deception checks failing automatically. Ilmater and Torm often come to the court to consult with Tyr. During the 4th edition era, Tyr had perished in 1385 Dale Reckoning. Torm and Ilmater had rejoined on the same cosmological plane of Celestia. In Ilmater's realm of martyrdom, Tyr's sword Justicier was plunged into a stone plinth. Carved into the stone was the image of a scale along with the words Justice Endures, clearly as a monument to their former superior and friend Tyr. Allies and Allegiances Tyr's two primary allies are Torm and Ilmater. Together, these three deities form a group known as the Triad. Ilmater and Torm view Tyr as their superior and serve him dutifully. In particular, Ilmater guides the blind Tyr as they travel. Torm serves Tyr as his champion and fighting general. Tyr's one other ally includes Lathander. Enemies. Tyr is largely against any deity that promotes tyranny, evil, or lawlessness. Though Tyr shows a fair amount of disfavor for Bane, Siric, Mask, 
Tolona, and Talos. Whether you want to consider Lara an enemy of Tears is a matter of perspective. Lara is likely indifferent to any negative feelings Tyr hold for the goddess of illusions, while Tyr is not a fan of any illusions to cover what is the truth. Deity and Avatar Stat Blocks The second edition stat block for Faerunian Tyr's Avatar can be found in the supplement Faiths and Avatars. The third edition stat block for Faerunian Tyr and his Avatar can be found in the supplement Faiths and Pantheons. The second edition stat block of the Norse version of Tyr's Avatar can be found in the supplement Legends and Lore. The third edition stat block of the Norse version of Tyr can be found in the supplement Deities and Demigods. Symbols In the Norse pantheon, simply Tyr's symbol is a sword. In Faerun, Tyr's singular symbols across all editions is a set of balanced scales sitting atop the head of a warhammer. Given that the long sword both is Tyr's weapon of choice and one of the chief weapons of his faith, you'd think that the sword would be part of Tyr's symbol, not the warhammer. However, this may have been done to more easily differentiate the symbols of Tyr from that of Tempest, both in canon as well as from a design perspective in real life. The Warhammer is tied together with the balanced scale symbolically to represent that Tyr has the strength and will to ensure that proper justice is carried out. Central Dogma from Faiths and Pantheons, a 3rd edition supplement. Quote, Reveal the truth, punish the guilty, right the wrong, and always be true and just in your actions. Uphold the law wherever you go, and punish those who do wrong under the law. Keep a record of all your rulings, deeds, and decisions, for through this your errors can be corrected, your grasp on the laws of all lands will flourish, and your ability to identify lawbreakers will expand. Be vigilant in your observations and anticipations, so you may detect those who plan injustices before their actions threaten law and order. Deliver vengeance to the guilty, for those who cannot do it themselves. End quote. Presence of the Faith Most folks who worshipped here on Faerun include paladins, judges, magistrates, lawyers, guards, and the oppressed. Those who follow Tyr tend to be stiff-necked individuals, often only seeing things in black and white terms. They do not take any slight against their patron deity lightly, even if it is in jest. Though some do hold a parental countenance to them that makes them likable to other folks. Tyrans have a strong sense of fairness and ensure that due process is carried out or vigilance is pursued if warranted. As expected from their lawful good patron, mercy is usually granted to wrongdoers. Common folk can guarantee that Tyrian clergy or lay folk will be forthright, honorable, and just. They typically are of lawful good, lawful neutral, or neutral good alignment. The Tyrian faith can be both seen as a force for change and a force to keep the status quo. This, of course, depends upon the context the faith finds itself in. A settlement or region where lawlessness and crime run rampant in need of order, or a settlement or region that has seen little to no revision to its legal code for centuries. Tyr worshippers in the justice system will make prayers to their patron deity to provide them guidance and see that proper justice is carried out. Tyr and his faith are most present in urban areas. In the southern region of Kalmshan, Tyr's faith is not large, but it is old. Here an alias known as Anok Tyr is worshipped, and the records show that the worship and temples of this entity preceded that of Tyr's emergence into the Forgotten Realms. Thus it is said in legend, and speculated that Anoctir was an older deity who was Tyr's predecessor, who then went on to pass along their mantle to Tyr after his arrival. In Kalmshan, Tyr's faith is popular among adventurers, military types, and idealistic young people. The Black Lions tribe found at Beorunna's well is an Uthgart tribe that no longer worships the god Uthgar. Instead, they worship the triad in Helm. Uthgar himself contemplated declaring the Triad and Helm his enemies for stealing away the worship of his people, but Tempest persuaded him that was not a good course of action, given the strong alliance good deities hold with one another. 
The Order of the Gauntlet is a strong faction in the Sword Coast made up of holy warriors and adventurers devoted to fighting evil out in the open. Members of this order worship Torm, Tyr, Helm, and the Doombreaker. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy There are radical and zealous Tyrion sects of worshippers who practice self-mutilation to emulate the pain and sacrifices suffered by Tyr in the past. These sects are condemned and pushed out to the boundaries by the rest of the faith. Tyr's clerical hierarchy is stringently organized. The ranks of the clergy in ascending order are Acolyte of Laws, Psalm Brother or Sister, Law Keeper, Sword of Tyr, Hammer of Tyr, Vigilant Watcher, Just Captain, Avenger, Master Avenger, Abbot, High Lord Abbot, High Avenger, Knight Commander, Hammer Lord, Defender of Justice, and Keeper of the Balance. Please do keep in mind this rank structure is from a second edition supplement, so it is likely that it may, may have evolved over the course of history, though it is a good basis to go off of. Responsibilities and Duties of Clergy and Worshippers those layfolk with faithful to the Tyrian faith are granted lodging, equipment, and healing in their times of need, though it may be that this aid be returned in kind at a later date. In areas rife with crime and lawlessness, the clergy of Tyr serve as prosecutors and executioners. In areas that are far tamer, they are equally as involved in the, ju- in the judicial system, though involving themselves more in the development of the law and serving in the defense of those accused. No law that is proven to be unjust is to be upheld by the Tyrian faith. However, even some just laws still do not sit well with the faith. Therefore, the Tyrian faith in that particular region or settlement will do what they can to have the law revised going through the proper channels and systems. The warriors of Tyr can also be counted upon for seeking retribution against those who wrong others, especially the lay folk. These are undertaken as missions and are openly pursued. Clerics of Tyr carry a book called the Book of Lawgiving. Within it, the cleric writes the names of a lawbreaker and the punishment given. These books are shared with Tyrian temples so as to keep a detailed record of the crime. This way, if the same perpetrator is found committing the same crime once more, a harsher and more appropriate penalty can be given. Each Tyrian temple has its own internal rules. These rules, called the Enumeral Edicts, are to be followed to the letter. No Tyrian clergy member is to bask in their own celebrity, as it were. They are expected to be humble in their bearing, even in the face of great and well-known success. Should a given Tyrian's identity and presence in a given region become too great, it is not unheard of for the clergy to ship them off elsewhere. There, hopefully, they will go unrecognized, and they may even adopt a new name entirely. Only those who have given up their lives in the name of justice and Tyr are to be remembered. Orders and Priestly Bodies The Knights of the Holy Judgment are a tyrant order of paladins dedicated to the fulfillment of the letter of the law. The Knights of the Merciful Sword are a tyrant order of paladins who are far more merciful and understanding. They regularly take on quests to fight and slay evil creatures, though they are known most for fighting demons. The Hammer of the Grim Jaws is an elite order of paladins who draw their numbers from the best of the Knights of the Holy Judgment and the Knights of the Merciful Sword. Admittance into the Hammers is done first through a nomination process. First, the individual needs to be nominated by a member of the Hammers, and second, they must be nominated by a senior clergy member. The final act before becoming welcomed into the Hammers is to stand vigil in front of a Tyrian place of worship throughout the night. If the nominee receives a vision of a Warhammer from Tyr, they are admitted. If no vision is seen, they are deemed to be too inexperienced, but are welcome to try again later. If they receive a vision of a sword, this means the individual has in some way, knowingly or unknowingly, failed Tyr. The individual must then go upon a quest of atonement. If they succeed in their quest, they are then admitted into the Hammers. This order is very small, only having close to a dozen members. The Just Knights are an order based out of the House of Tyr's Hand in Thesk. They often battle with the evil forces of Thay to the east. Hands of Tyr are special priests of Tyr who act in a similar function to paladins, tracking down evildoers and seeking justice. 
all the while maintaining their function as full clergy members. They are a passionate group bordering on zealotry who seek to defend the weak. The scales are another special group group of Tyrian priests. They are priests who are actively involved in the judicial proceedings of their land, far more so in regions where little to no law exists. They are a stern and unemotional lot who are methodical in adjudicating and ensuring that the proper laws are brought to bear in court. A triad has a long history in, in, in an impilter. Starting in 729 Deal Reckoning, the tri- Triad Crusade began when an army dedicated to the Triad traveled to Impilter and started the fiend wars against the Scaled Horde. The Impiltern throne was seized by King Angrosh the Scaled, and the population was driven into exile. Out of this war, the Order of the Triad was formed to defend against any more fiendish, fiendish incursions into Impilter. Over the years, this order's strength waned from battles and political strife. In 1196 Dale Reckoning, King Infress II of Impilter created the Most Holy Order of the Scale Shrike after interpreting the, si- the sight of a shrike, killing a small demon as an omen. The Knights of Infress II are an elite order of paladins pledged to the crown of Impilter for life. Their formal name is the Most Holy Order of the Sacred Shrike, and they are composed solely of paladins in service to one of the Triad. They specialize in hunting down fiends and any threat from ancient Narfel to the northeast. Three lords serve as the triumvirate of the order, each one representing the deities of the triad. They are each given the title of war captain. The day-to-day management of the order is carried out by the Council of Shrike Lords, a body of 40 paladins and clerics. Each member of the order is considered a member of Impilter's standing army, and most of them are recognized as officers. Pockets of the abyss known as demon cis are buried beneath Impilter, and this order are the specialists trained to fight against what fiends may come out of the cis and whatever humanoid cultists or, uh, and or creatures align themselves with the demons. Joining this order requires an oath of fealty to the Impilter crown and sponsorship from one of the three faiths of the triad. Then the test of the triad must be completed whereby an individual must confront and or defeat three of Impilter's foes with bravery. The Knights of Samilar is a paladin order based out of Waterdeep. This order is named after the Tyrian war hero Samilar Caradun from the Second Troll War. They work to uphold the law of the city. This order kept true to Tyr's name even after their prayers went unanswered and lost their powers following Tyr's death. The members of the Janissar are worshippers of the Triad deities. The Janissar are mounted defenders of the poor and oppressed in Kalmshan. They patrol the roads, taking out slaving caravans, bandits, and highwaymen. They move in small squads of five to six members composed of priests, clerics, fighters, and or paladins. Their true numbers are unknown given the secrecy they attach themselves and what seems to be their unwillingness to gather large groups They have secret strongholds in the marching mountains and are led by three elderly priests of each faith who have given up their martial duties. The Knights Kaldar of Beric Moradin, also known as the Beric Moradana, are a militant group of holy warriors in service to the Triad who live in a fortified abbey on a road between Daromar and Seridush and Tathir. They have an alliance with the Janissar, but after that have little contact with the other groups associated with the Triad. The knights aim to heal the sick, help the weak, and avenge those harmed by injustice. This group is far more eclectic than other triadic groups. The majority of the knights are worshippers of Torm, though the group is led by a commander from each of the three faiths. Justiciers of Tyr are individual paragons of law and service in the Tyrian faith. Justiciers may serve in a policing capacity upholding the laws in a given city or settlement, while others can be found out in frontier regions of Faerun or even throughout the plains doing battle against those who are lawless and evil. The Order of the Even-Handed in Waterdeep is a monastic order of monks housed in a small monastery up on the slopes of Mount Waterdeep. Here, Grand Master Halam has long taught his pupils in the way of the Sacred Fists, combining both cleric and monk abilities together. Each practitioner looks to cap their training off with a solo adventure in service of Tyr. They also seem to have some sort of friendly rivalry with Helmite monks. 
The monks of the Blinding Truth are another order of monks trained and housed in the Abbey of Blinding Truth in Chess. The Companions of El Tugard are a mixed group of paladins with different patron deities. Those in the Companions usually worship Tyr, Torm, Helm, or Lathander, Slash, and Monitor. The Right Hand of Tyr is an order of Tyrian knights located in Raven's Bluff. Appearance and Dress the ceremonial dress of Tyr consists of a blue and purple robe adorned with a white sash. Gloves or gauntlets are worn on both hands, though the one on the left hand is to be white in color, while the one on the right is to be black. The color of black is meant to symbolize Tyr's lost hand. While adventuring, clergy will wear armor they are proficient with, or wear other clothing that is often adorned on the shoulders and back with the symbol of Tyr. Following the time of troubles, when Tyr was blinded, clergy began tying a thin white cloth or gauze over top of their eyes to acknowledge the loss of their patron deity's sight. The hands of Tyr wear a full suit of white armor and helmet. Over top this armor is a white and gold tabard embroidered with a golden symbol of Tyr on the front. They wield a warhammer in each of their hands. The scales wear an elaborate outfit when carrying out their duties. They often wear chainmail or plate, and over top, over top that armor is a white robe. They carry a warhammer in one hand and a silver scale in the other, effectively embodying the holy symbol of Tyr. Finally, the most signature piece of their outfit is the helmet they wear with a sealed visor which renders them completely blind. This is done for the purpose of allowing the scale to hear the proceedings before them without being swayed by the appearances and visible actions of the parties before them. Rituals. Clerics of Tyr pray for their spells at dawn. There are three holy days in each month for the Tyrian faith. Each of these holy days involves prayer, the singing of hymns, and the conjuration of large illusions. The first holy day takes place on the first of each month and is known as the Seeing Justice. The illusion conjured on this day is a glowing white hot warhammer surrounded by bright light. The second holy day takes place on the 13th of each month and is known as the Maiming. The illusion conjured up on this day is that of burning blood engulfing a right hand. The third holy day takes place on the 22nd of each month and is known as the Blinding. The illusion conjured on this day is a pair of eyes that turn into a fountain of flaming tears. Clergy wear their ceremonial white bindings across their eyes during this ceremony. Daily services are given by temples to the lay folk. These services involve sung invocations, prayers led by a senior priest, a sermon involving personal wisdom, or a reading from the sacred judgments of Tyr, ending with a loud hymn. I don't know if lay folk are expected to attend all of these services daily or whether they are just offered daily by Tyrian places of worship. The clergy, however, have far more daily services to attend to. These services are carried out once every two hours during the waking day. The awakening is the dawn ritual. It is a gentle, relaxed service. The hammer at high sun is a ritual at noon. It is a boisterous service espousing martial virtues. High justice is the ritual that takes place during the dinner hours. It is a stern reaffirmation of the face responsibilities. Finally, the remembrance of the just fallen takes place during the evening. It is a solemn service involving quiet chants offered to those who have given their lives in the name of justice. General Locations of Places of Worship Temples to Torm double as fortifications and are well funded by the well put together system that governs the faith. Places of worship to Tyr are found in the urban areas of the world that some consider more civilized. Your typical Tyrian temple offers a fair amount of different services to worshippers and lay people alike. Mounts, healing services, weapons, armor and other equipment, consultation, and confessional services. Specific Locations of Places of Worship Watcher's Knoll in the Dalens was the site of a massacre of Tyrans as a result of religious intolerance and persecution in 1297 Dale Reckoning. Such persecution and violence was backed by the Lord of the Dales at the time. The site now serves as a place of solemn remembrance and pilgrimage for traveling Tyrans who leave flowers behind. The fortress faithful in Tithir is regarded as the most influential Tyrian temple. 
The House of Tyr is a massive temple in Milvarune in the nation of Thesk. Those from this temple are regarded as a more traditional sect of Tyrans. This temple houses the Just Knights. Going out into realm space for a moment, there is a contingent of Tyr worshippers found on the Rock of Brawl, one of the Tyrs of Saloon. They have a temple here known as the Pantheus Temple of Tyr. The Tyrans here are in a rough spot but revel in that fact. The Rock of Brawl is a haven for spell jamming pirates. The Tyrans here combat these injustices as a result and are quite unpopular. The House of the Triad in Bryn Shander is a large temple made out of stone by dwarven hands. The House of the Triad is housed by cycling clergy from the three faiths of the Triad who stay on for a period of two years in this position. They typically come from Neverwinter and Waterdeep. The Halls of Justice in Waterdeep is a compound structure found in the Castle Ward of Waterdeep. Tyrans in Waterdeep have had a big role to play in the governance of the city. The Abbey of the Just Hammers can be found in the Dun Hills. The clergy at this abbey go out and eradicate evil creatures in the region. Their Hall of Entry here bears trophies taken from the various creatures they have killed. The deep cells beneath Darloon are said to be hallowed in Tyr's name. It is said that the guilty who are placed into these cells are brought elsewhere by Tyr to some unknown end. The Silver Halls in Raven's Bluff overlooks six city streets. It has been purposely built to look like an imposing structure. Affixed to the domed roof of this temple is a lightning rod crafted in the shape of a warhammer. The waiting in Flan is made out of white marble and features balanced scales prominently in its decoration. There are consecrated burial grounds beneath this temple for those who are lawful good or who are worshippers of Tyr. The four tallest mountains in the Star Spire mountain range sit by one another. They are known as the Grim Jaws. At one time, a monastery and stronghold dedicated to Tyr was established somewhere between them. It was eventually overrun by monsters, and the, mo and the mountains thereafter were named both to allude both to their importance to Tyr, as well as their dangers that live upon the slopes. Southeast of Arkenbridge is a small chapel dedicated to Tyr in a rather unremarkable area. It serves as a lesser known pilgrimage site for Tyr and worshippers. Housed inside this chapel looks to be the statue of a planetar angel. In fact, it is the petrified remains of resounding justice, a planetar once in service to Tyr, frozen in stone, sacrificing herself to slay two evil foes. Her stone corpse radiates all sorts of beneficial auras, radiating blue and white lights throughout the night. The Hand of Justice is a shrine to Tyr in Grunwald. Here the gauntlet of a giant serves as a shrine, and it is attended to by six clergy members. The Abbey of the Blinding Truth can be found in Westgate. This abbey was built with the intention to bring law and order to the city of Westgate. What's more is that the abbey was built close by to a temple of masks to, to serve as a warning. Much like other Tyrian places of worship, this is more a fortification than it is your traditional abbey housed by paladins, clerics, monks, and warriors who all hold Tyr as their patron deity. Housed inside the grounds is the cathedral where worship is carried out. This tall building looks out and casts a wide gaze. The carving upon its doors displays the tale of the consequences of corruption. Summit Hall is a monasterial house for the Knights of Samular up in the Summer Hills. Here the remains of their founder, Samular Caradun, are interred. Hardy and experienced veterans of the order train those who come to join the Knights. Before Elturel met its date, as it is found in Baldur's Gate Descent to Avernus, the worship of Tyr, Lathander, Torm, and Helm was strong here. It is, or maybe still is, however you want to phrase it, a very lawful and peaceful city. The Hall of Everlasting Justice is a temple split in worship between Torm and Tyr and Sundavar. The Hall of Justice in Neverwinter is well supported by Lord Nevermember, who advocates for the rule of law in his city. Between the border of Sembia and Cormir is a border stone. The border stone rises 12 feet high, and there is a sizable circle that has been cut out of a portion of it. This hole serves as a two-way portal. This portal is key to activate only three times per day at sunrise, noon, 
which is also known as High Sun in Faerun, and Sunset. The portal is also key to three different destinations based on the deity that location is associated with. If you walk through this side of the portal with a symbol of Tyr and Elmater, you end up in Glister. If you walk through the side of the portal with a symbol of Tyr and Torm, you end up in Cormanthor. Finally, if you walk through this side of the portal with a symbol of Tyr and Helm, you end up on the banks of River Shionthar. This portal system is of great value to the patrons of the Triad and Helm, who often work together with common cause. Named temples to Tyr include the Measure House in Calumport, the Hall of Brilliant Justice in Uthmir, Hall of the Avenging Hammer in Tefalem, and the Just Hall in Alamontir. Unnamed temples to Tyr can be found in Hawk's Ness, Tazir, Ashperta, Taniston Barony, and Ashabenford. Unnamed shrines to Tyr can be found in Suzale, in the region surrounding the towns of Ilper and Pros, Thentia, and Lelon. Character Options For 2nd edition, the supplement Face and Avatars has the breakdown for the Holy Justice, which is a specialty priest of Tyr. The supplement Warriors and Priests of the Realms has a special ability for Crusaders dedicated to Tyr, and the breakdown for the Hand and Scale, both specific priests of Tyr. The supplement City of Splendors Waterdeep contains the Hand of Tyr feat. For 3rd edition, the supplement Champions of Valor has a lot of different options. The Ward of the Triad Regional Background, Exalted Feats for those who are Knights of Holy Judgment or Knights of the Merciful Sword, Mark of the Triad, Divine Feat, Holy Judge Substitution Levels for Paladin devoted to Tyr, and the Triadic Knight Prestige Class. The Supplement Player's Guide to Faerun contains the Justicier of Tyr Prestige Class and Epic Levels for this Prestige Class, and the Initiate of Tyr Feet. Next is just a breakdown of the features of what I think someone deeply involved in Tyr's faith, as an accolade or otherwise, would have for a potential background in 5th edition. For your two skill proficiencies, I would take a look at having athletics, as well as either intimidation or persuasion. For your language or tool proficiencies, I would take calligrapher supplies, only to more or less represent your ability to draft uh, various law codes, rulings, etc., etc., and also vehicles land. For your equipment, obviously you can take a look at the acolytes from the player's handbook, but on top of that, there's also the City City Watch background and the Knight of the Order background, both from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, though using some of the gold that you're given there to have a holy symbol available to you right from the start. Finally, for the ribbon feature attached to backgrounds, I know I say this all the time for pretty much every background, but there's always the Acolytes Shelter the Faithful, once again, that being from the Player's Handbook. But there's the City Watch's Watcher's Eye, in the Knights of the Order's Knight of Regard features, both of which can be found in Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. This is just a list of subclasses that I would think to be thematically appropriate for an NPC or player character to take if they are a worshipper of Tyr. For the Barbarian, there is the Ancestral Guardian, which is found in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, as well as the Zealot. For the Bard, there is the College of Swords Bard, from Xanthar's Guide, and the College of Valor Bard from the Player's Handbook. For the Cleric, there is obviously the War Domain found in the Player's Handbook, but on top of that I'd also look at the War Domain, which can be found in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. For the Fighter, there's a, quite a few here, so there's the Battle Master from the Player's Handbook, the Champion, the Cavalier from Xanthar's Guide to Everything, Purple Dragon Knight, which can be found in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, as well as the Samurai, which is also in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Monk, there's the Open Hand Monk from player, the Player's Handbook, and the Kensai Monk from the Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Paladin, there's the Oath of the Crown Paladin from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, and the Oath of Devotion and the Oath, Oath of the Vengeance Paladins, both found in the Player's Handbook. For the Ranger, there's the Hunter from the Player's Handbook, and there's the Monster Slayer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Rogue, there's the Inquisitive Rogue, and I'll, I'll admit here I am reaching with suggesting a Rogue for Tyr, but I would take a look at the Inquisitive Rogue from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Sorcerer, there's the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, 
or the Warlock, there's the Celestial Patron, Warlock from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and finally for Wizard, there's the College of War Wizard from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Dungeon Master Options First, I'd just like to run through some monsters that are available to Dungeon Masters in 5th edition sources that they can make use of in their games. For on the Monster Manual, there's your Gold Dragons, your Silver Dragons, uh, and your three various types of angels, your devas, planetars, and solars. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Kyren or Kiren, not 200% sure on that pronunciation. From the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, there's the Archon of the Triumvirate, Aurelia, who is a named NPC in that uh, setting, but could easily be reflavored to kind of work in a Forgotten Realm setting, as well as the Battleforce Angel. If you're looking through any non-5th edition sources that you have available to you, there are stat blocks for the various tiers of Archons, starting from Lantar, starting from Lantern, working their way up to Tome, and they can be found in all sorts of different sources. For example, if you have the Planes of Law Planescape Supplement, they can be found there, as well as the 3.5 Monster Manual. To round out the section on monsters, the following is just a list of humanoid MP stat blocks to represent various tier worshippers and clergy from 5th edition sources. Always keep in mind with the spellcasters, you can always swap out their listed spells for other spells that are more fitting to the themes you're trying to get at with them. From the monster manual, there's the acolyte, the priest, the knight, and the veteran. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the champion, war, pl- war priest, and warlord. From Out of the Abyss, there's the Veteran of the Gauntlet. And finally, from Waterdeep, Dragon Heist, there is a stat block in there for the Grandmaster Halem himself. Next, let's talk about magic items. The Balance of Belaros. This holy item is named after the smith Belaros, a legendary Tyrion smith and warrior. The Balance itself is a set of bronze color scales that hover in the air. The bronze pans of the scale are not physically linked to the main body of the scales. However, they seem fixed in the same location as if they were linked by chains. The scales can be moved so long as they are held by the main body. The scales also appear to have no weight to them. The primary function of the scales is the production of spell scrolls apparently out of nowhere. Placing an appropriate offering in one of the pans will result in the offering vanishing, then a spell scroll will be placed in the opposite pan. Which spell scroll is chosen from its known roster seems to be random with no real pattern between the type of offering and spell scroll given. Other than the same spell scroll does not appear twice in a row. The whereabouts of the balance of Belaros is unknown at this time. It was last reported to be seen in the markets of Burdusk and Silvery Moon. Some Tyrans believe that the Harpers have the balance in their possession, However, these accusations have been denied by the Harpers. The Balance of Belaros can be found in the second edition of Supplement Prayers from the Faithful. Kimiltar, also known as the Demon Bane's Shield, was forged alongside two other shields long ago in reverence to a Noctir. In the divine instruction sent by their patron deity, three temples created these three shields to combine the, to combat the fiendish incursion brought about by the Shun Imperium. All three of these shields were consecrated by a manifestation of Tyr. As the years progressed, they came to Impilter. In the 8th century Dale Reckoning, these other two shields would be destroyed in combat with the demon lord Nadulu, but not before they helped to send Nadulu back to the Abyss. The insignia of Tyr's symbol on both these shields would merge with Kimiltar, after which Kimiltar came to be known as the ham- Hammer Shield of Impilter. The last known whereabouts of the shield was aboard the dowry ship Nadira's Glory, sailing from Impilter to Cormir in 926 Dale Reckoning, before never being seen again. Further details and a breakdown of the Kimiltar's power can be found in the second edition supplement, Sea of Fallen Stars. The Rings of Might are simple bands adorned with Tyr's symbol, created to be worn by priests of Tyr. By striking someone with your fist wearing the ring, a magical imprint of Tyr's symbol be- will be left on the individual being struck. The description of the Ring of Might can be found in the 2nd edition module Ruins of Undermountain 2 and the 3rd edition supplement Magic of Faerun. 
The axe of heavenly fire is a holy great axe sacred to the Tyran faith. It can be found in the second edition supplement, City of Splendor's Waterdeep. The crown of Narfil was once worn by the rulers of the evil empire of Narfil. After the empire fell, the evil artifact lie forgotten in the lower levels of a citadel. That was until the paladin Sarshel found it and shattered it in 731 Dale Reckoning. Sarshel gathered up its pieces and the high priest of the triad face took them. The pieces were reforged and the crown went on to serve as the crown of Impilter. In its reforged form, this mithril crown bears four symbols, the three respective symbols of the deities of the triad and Impilter's coat of arms. More details and a greater breakdown of the Crown of Narfil can be found in 3rd edition supplement, Champions of Valor. Just as blades are plus one longswords made of bronze and stamped with the symbol of Tyr, they shed white light out to a radius of 20 feet. They can be found in the 3rd edition supplement, Magic of Faerun. The Warhammer of Tyr is a magical warhammer that glows with a vibrant blue color. This artifact functions much like a dwarven thrower, returning to the wielder's hand after being thrown. It also can cast out a very bright light spell that emits sunlight and can potentially destroy undead. The Hammer of Tear, excuse me, the Warhammer of Tear can be found in the second edition supplement Heroes Lore Book. To round out the section of magic items, here are just a list of thematically appropriate magic items from official 5th edition sources I feel the Faith of Tyr might have access to. Just for the record, uh, Tyr's Faith tends to favor Warhammers along swords as weapons. From the Dungeon Master's Guide. The Animate Shield. The Book of Exalted Deeds. Bracers of Defense. Cloak of Protection. Darren's Instant Fortress. Dancing Sword, Defender, Dwarven Thrower, Gauntlets of Ogre Power, Gold and Silver Dragon Scale Mail, Holy Avenger, The Various Horns of Valhalla, Mace of Disruption, Mace of Smiting, Manuals of Bodily Health and Gainful Exercise, Tome of Leadership and Influence, Necklace of Prayer Beads, Plate Armor of Etherealness, Potion of Heroism, Potion of Invulnerability, Ring of Protection, Various Scrolls of Protection, Sentinel Shield, The Spellguard Shield, Staff of Striking, Talisman of Pure Good, and finally, plus one to plus three Warhammers and Longswords. From Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, you could reflavor the Orzov Guild Signet. And finally, from Waterdeep Dragon Heist, there is the Ring of Truth-Telling. Alright, thank you for listening to Religion of the Realms. If you are interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. The podcast YouTube channel can be found under the title Religion in the Realms. Audio versions of the podcast can be found on Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play Podcast as well. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter is at Shiv's Embrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. For those interested, I have posted a link in the video description to a Discord server I have set up. For audio listeners, you can find the link to that invite pinned on the podcast Twitter page. In the next episode, I will be finishing up my look at the Triad with an episode on Ilmater, God of Suffering and Endurance. So, until next time, may Timor look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path.
Music for this episode, Hidden Past, by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.